everything I do is optimized. So I've got a very specific morning routine, very specific diet, very specific workout, very specific mindset. Does it get boring sometimes? Yeah, of course. Of course, but I've chosen this life because I've chosen to play at the high level that I'm at. This Do you ever get sick of it? What's up, guys? Welcome to the On Track with Annie podcast here with Bedros, a serial entrepreneur most known for founding Fit Body Bootcamp, now urges and inspires others to go after what they truly want in life and reach their fullest potential. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Annie. Appreciate you coming out. I love this studio. It's an awesome setup. Yeah, yeah. We got a, it's not a bad setup we have. Yeah, how long have you guys been here? We had the building for, I think, since 2016. So we're going on, I don't know, eight years or so. And we wanted to make this room really special so we can run one, two, three, four different podcasts out of this room at any given time with the different sets. Yeah, I love it. So one thing that I like to start out with, just to give everyone a brief overview of who you are and mm -hmm. how you got to where you are today. Yep. What is how, what's the story behind how you got started to where you are now? Well, how I got started to where I am is because I realized I never wanted to be broke again. Mm -hmm. um, came, came to the United States as a immigrant from the Soviet Union. I was six years old. My mom and dad decided they want to escape the Soviet Union because my dad was a member of the Communist Party. I've got an older brother who's 14, 14 years older, got an older sister who's 16 years older than me. So I'm the oops baby. And um, they escape. We come here to the United States. We're living in Section 8 housing. We're eating government cheese. We're, we've got food stamps. Sometimes we have to dig food out of dumpsters behind grocery stores. Not like half-eaten food. Like whenever I tell people that, they think it's, uh, we're digging out half-eaten food. It's not half-eaten food. It's these dumpsters behind grocery stores where they throw away food that's expired so they can't sell it. And my dad discovered these dumpsters. And he's like, dude, it's like good food back there that sealed up still or there might there might be bread that has some mold on it my mom would just pick off the mold and we'd eat it but when you're on a very very tight fixed budget that's how you roll uh but the thing that made me want to become obscenely rich was a incident that took place remember i said my sister is 16 years older than me so she was 20 years old when we came here and i was six and she uh had a job at a pizzeria like within the first month of us coming here. And the owner of that pizzeria was a real jerk. He was very suggestive with her. He was very handsy with her. And this isn't the time like it is today where you could have evidence because there's an iPhone and you can videotape it and, or you can go and there's a Me Too movement and you can, there's someone you can go to, HR. Like this is 1980. And so my sister would come home crying and saying, I don't want to work that job. And my dad would say, look, just one more month. We need the money. We're all working. We need to get out of the Section 8 housing and find a place, a cleaner apartment complex with no gangs, et cetera. And so since my sister was like a second mom to me because she's so much older than me, um, I felt helpless as a kid. And I remember going up to her one of the times that she was crying to my dad and begging him, like, I, I, I want to quit this job. Uh, and, I, and I told her, hey, one day I'm going to be so rich, you'll never have to work again. Thinking in my child brain that that's going to solve her problem in that moment, obviously not. Um, but at least I had some sense of control. And so I kept my word. And that made me realize that when you have money, you have options. When you have money, you have choices. When you have money, you have opportunities. And I never wanted my sister to have, uh, be limited in opportunities, choices, and options. And so for the last 15 years, she's been unemployed because she just works for me full time doing nothing, which I love. And, but clearly that didn't solve her problem. But I was hell bent on never living in Section 8 housing, hell bent on never being broke, hell bent on never being called a foreigner, hell bent on never being told to go back to my own country. And I knew that when you have money, you have respect. When you have money, you have access. When you have money, you have opportunities, choices, etc. So for me, um, it's almost like the pendulum swung w way too far the other way. But I also value freedom. I love what this country stands for. And so I know that there's no other country on the planet that an immigrant can come to and create multiple different companies, work his nuts off, and um, be able to exit and sell a few of those companies for, for millions of dollars and be able to acquire other companies and be able to build a personal brand on using your iPhone and some, some cameras and microphones. Like, 
what the it's hell? Wild. It's wild. Where else are you going to do this, right? And so I was like, my dad gave me a gift by bringing me here, and I'm going to absolutely milk it. But my rule is um, money without meaning means nothing. And so my sense of meaning is to be able to give back. I, I'm, I'm very... Um, give back focused. And so I've adopted three massive charities, adopted uh, Compassion International, where I've got 97 kids adopted through there. Um, Shriners Children's Hospital, where they do medical services, procedures, anything from building out wheelchairs to fixing a cleft palate to burn victims. These are for kids whose families can't afford the, uh, the uh, medical services. And then every year we buy tens of thousands of dollars of toys for Toys for Tots out here in Southern California. And kids who would wake up on Christmas morning and never have a gift to open will have a gift because of Toys for Tots and our contribution to them. And so uh, I'm very much focused on money and meaning. And so I brought those two worlds together and it's just served me well. But I've forced myself to become an entrepreneur because of the freedom that money affords me. Yeah, well, I think there's dirty money and there's clean money. I would say how do so. You, how do you make it? Mm -hmm. And what what do you stand for? That's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I always see when I'm watching content is, okay, someone comes from zero yep. and then they're here. But no one ever really dives into the meat of it. How did you actually get to that place? So what is a 24 hours for you when you are working your way up that will actually get you to where you want to be to reach your fullest potential? Yeah, good question. So let's kind of treat this like a coaching moment because just upstairs I had um, a coaching client right before coming down here and he was a brand new coaching client. So I was drawing out this thing. I said, what is it that you, a problem that you solve that people would pay for to solve that problem? Mm -hmm. Like, do you have that idea? He goes, yes. I go, solving that problem in exchange for money, would that give you joy? He said, yes. I said, when that line, the income line of solving problems in exchange for money, and it gives you joy to solve those problems, when those lines cross, you have purpose. That's where purpose meets. Because think about how many people, and in fact, there's a term for it, they call it golden handcuffs. Mm -hmm. They have a job, a career, hell, a company that they built, but it's become a golden handcuffs. It gives them good money, but they hate doing it. They resent their employees. They resent their, their business partners. They resent, resent, resent. I never wanted that. And I've had that, not because I was so smart and didn't have it. I had it and I realized like, I'd rather like be homeless and have that freedom than have money freedom, but no personal freedom yeah. and just hate my life. And so the, the fastest way I can explain this is Find a problem that you can solve in exchange for money. So if there's a mass amount of people that have this specific problem, for example, what you do, you help people get fit and lose weight and stay fit. Well, that's definitely a problem that people are willing to pay for a solution. I imagine it brings you joy seeing people transform and build their confidence and their health and their fitness, 100%. right? And so where those lines cross, I would say you're living your purpose. And so that's what you're after. So then how do you do that at a high scale? Well, social media allows us to scale that because you create content, content very similar to this, content that you would create in the gym, content that you create around the country. And by doing so, everyone's like, you know what? She knows what she's talking about. I think I want to work with her. Oh, she's in Florida. I'm in California. Oh, look, she's got an online coaching program. Now you could scale that to a place where literally you have five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 coaches under you. Like many of my coaching clients who are in the health, fitness, wellness space, have a whole bunch of coaches under them. They are the face of the brand. They pull in the customers and the leads. They've mentored their coaches to deliver the same results that they would deliver to those clients. And that's how they deliver the outcome. Uh, just like our Fit Body Bootcamp franchise. I thought of the idea of Fit Body Bootcamp. Now we have hundreds of locations across the country and Canada. And it's a replicatable, scalable model. Like there's people who probably listen to this and like, I didn't know he was the founder of Fit Body Bootcamp, but there's millions of people I help through health and fitness every day because of our franchise locations. It's scalable. How did we scale it? By me getting on social media, podcasts, YouTube, way back in the day, Facebook when it launched, now Instagram, uh, through a book, right? And literally building my personal brand. Like, and that simply means here's who I am, Here's what I do, and here's proof of it that I do well. That's how you build a personal brand. So what an average 24-hour looks like for me to do this uh, these days is different. These days I lead my leaders, and my leaders lead the teams and the companies, right? I have seven companies. Each of them have a leader. Uh, but there used to be a time when I was just the CEO of one company. Uh, I would wake up, and I would focus on the things that would 
multiply our leads. It was always money generating tasks first and then uh, kind of foundational tasks after. So what's going to help me generate leads today? What's going to help my salespeople uh, get leads in front of them so that they can close them into coaching clients or franchise owners so that those franchise owners can get clients? Well, okay, now we got to support them. So now we have these new franchise owners. They need to build out a location. They need to find a location. They need to hire. They need to get a conditional use permit from the city. Let's help them out. They're franchisees. They sign up for a reason. But I focus on the little hinges that swing the big doors. I don't focus on whispers. I focus on shouts. Another way to say that is I focus on the one, two, threes, not the eight, nine, tens. Uh, what I mean by that is sometimes people go, well, sh should I use active campaign or MailChimp or constant contact to manage my email list? It doesn't matter. That's a whisper. What matters is how are you going to move people from social media onto your email list? What is the free thing that you're going to give away to demonstrate competency, to demonstrate proof that you're an expert at what you do? So you can say, hey, thanks for watching my podcast. If you love this and you want to get fit, lose weight, make money, whatever the thing is, go to betteroscoolium.com forward slash whatever and get this free thing because I want to give a free thing away. So my whole concept has been I want to push the free line. I want to say who I am and then tell them what I do, and then prove it by putting social proof in front of them, clients, customers, you know, who have gotten the results, but then give them something that they can do and start seeing results from for free. And if I can do that, then they'll go, if he's given that away for free, imagine what his paid for services are going to be like. And that's called the top of the funnel, right? And, and, and so I've got my own podcast, I've got my own Instagram account, I've got my own show on YouTube. And I, and, and this hopefully will help me maybe get some coaching clients, maybe get some franchisees, maybe get some customers for our truly supplement line. But at the end of the day, someone's going to be like, well, okay, I like this Bedros guy. Maybe I'll watch his show. And now they come from Annie's show. They're watching my show. As they're watching my show, they see that I'm offering my six week marathon challenge or my book man up for free. They go to that website, give me their contact info. Now they're in my system of email marketing, right? Now we build a no like, and trust factor. And from there, once I've built a no like, and trust factor by demonstrating proof, giving them actionable stuff to do, I make them offers. Hey, do you want a franchise? Do you want to coach with me? Do you want to buy supplements? Do you want to buy fuel hunt apparel? Um, the model is simple, but all those things that I just listed off coaching, franchise, apparel, supplements, they are all solutions to problems that people have, right? Truly supplements is a solution to supplements that are inferior ingredients, that they use artificial sweeteners, artificial colors, uh, hormones. So we decided everything's going to be grass-fed in terms of the way we're going to use stevia and monk fruit and, and no artificial anything in terms of our ingredients. Uh, Fuel Hunt, we decided that when we created this brand, it needs to be American-made apparel. Like, we can't use the Eagle and the founders of the company. I took equity in the company. Uh, great example. They're from Philadelphia. Obviously, the eagle, mm -hmm. the Philadelphia bird, right? And the American bird. I'm like, guys, we have the eagle. And the whole idea is everybody wants to eat, but few will hunt. That's where the name came from. Like, I love that mantra. That's why I bought the shirts. I was a customer before I was ever, like, it solved the problem that I had, which was I want to wear something that's quality and has a bold message. Everybody wants to eat, but few will hunt. But the shirts are made in China, yet we're like an American brand. If I come on board and take equity, and inject money into the company, like one of the top two things you guys have to do is make, make this American made. Like, yeah, but it's gonna cost more and labor and material, da da da. If you do that, I promise you I can help move the needle because I'll be bought in, which means I'm now a brand, the people that follow me will be bought in. And sure enough, we found a way to get the shirts for basically $2 more. So the price went up from like 38 to $41, so like $3 more. Um, but no one balk, balked at it, and everyone loves it. It's American-made, top quality, and it's got a bold message about it. But it solved the problem. People were looking for an American brand that was American-made. And I was looking for that. Well, I know if I'm looking for that solution and I can't find it, I might as well be the provider of that solution to the masses who are looking for it. And so if people start looking at how do I get rich as a how do I solve other people's problems in exchange for money, and then once you've done it once, how can I scale that? Mm -hmm. Well, through processes, through social media, through building a team where you can multiply the outcome. Now you become obscenely rich and then hopefully you do a lot of good with that money. 
So let's say someone is starting out where they don't have a lot of money to put into their business. They don't have a team yet. It's mm-hmm. just them on their own. And let's say they're putting out content on social media because it seems like a lot of it is that. Yeah. And it's maybe not hitting. They're, they've been doing it for a year or so. The content's not really working out for them. What would you tell them? Yeah. First of all, when people say, my content's not hitting, I go, give me an example. I say, well, I'm not getting the views. I'm not getting the shares. I'm not getting the comments and the likes. Go, well, it's unlikely that Instagram, YouTube, or whatever, everyone wants to think that, well, I got shadow banned, right? Or, or yeah. you know, the algorithm. It's not. The algorithm will promote anything that's great, and it will not show anything that is mediocre and subpar. So I'm usually the guy that has to tell them, your product or your content, which is a product, is subpar. It's not great. You're probably not authentic. It's probably overproduced. Uh, you're probably not walking the walk. Like, look, you're in the fitness industry. Uh, I just met you. You stood up. You're fit. You're athletic. I now have a different level of respect for you than if you, if I walked in and knowing that you're in the fitness industry, but if you carried an extra 15, 20 pounds. Like, <laughs> that's just the facts. Like, we got to be walking, talking examples, I right? I wouldn't go to a dentist who's got like missing teeth and pussy mouth, <laughs> right? Good example. Same example. And so you've seen people who are in the fitness industry, but they look like they're permanently off season in terms of like, like when was the last time you actually had abs, dude? And so their <laughs> content's never going to hit because they're incongruent with the thing that they're putting out. And so if they can authentically put out great content that is congruent to the person and the message that they put out, uh, great content will always hit. It will always pop off. You won't go viral every time, but it will always pop off. And so if content's not popping off, it's because you're not authentically putting out the greatest content that's congruent to the man or woman that you are. It's as simple as that. So it's just trying different things. Yeah, yeah. Try, try different things. Like try being the person that your best friend, I always tell them, I'm like, if there was no cameras and you were just talking to your best friend, how would you show up, right? Like, oh, I can't do that on camera. I'm like, that's the person that's going to pop off. Because anything outside of that is an imposter. The person that your best friend gets to see or that your spouse gets to see, that is the authentic you. That person putting out the same piece of content with that level of animation and goofiness or whatever. Like, you know, when I do the BK show, uh, apparently there's a vein on one side of my neck or the other that pops up. And, and like people are like, oh my God, the vein. Like he really means something. Uh, it, it's out of passion. But that's when, I, when I'm talking to a family member, when I'm talking to a good friend, like that's how excited I get. I start spinning everywhere and the veins start popping off. If I were to deliver anything outside of that in my content, it wouldn't be me. And when I tried doing that on my previous show, The Empire Show, the more prim and proper business coach, I was actually not excited to even do the show, number one. The, I think the best episode that took off, we did 209 episodes of The Empire Show. We had on YouTube, it probably had like 4,000 views after a couple of years. Now, every one of my episodes within 24 hours, gets like 20,000 views. And then from there, it just goes into the hundreds of thousands. And it's not because of any other reason other than I show up as the person that I am when the cameras are not rolling. And so authenticity and speaking on camera like you would speak to a loved one or, or, or best friend is massively important. No, I feel like people try to be too professional, mm-hmm. too. They try to just make it seem like they're this person that they're yeah. not. And it's not even fun to watch because you can read people so easily. Totally. Like, people can tell if you're not, you know, be weird, honestly. That's what I always say. Right. Just be your absolute self and then that content will. Think about this. There's, there's versions of what we all do all over social media. Like if someone's a health coach, there's a million other health coaches. You're a mindset coach, there's a million other mindset coaches. You're an apparel company, there's a million other apparel companies. So... Everything you do already exists. So the only way you can stand out and differentiate is by being authentically, uniquely you. 100%. Yeah. So different side of this. But one thing that I always see when it comes to content and talking about, you know, living your best life is you got to have this morning routine. You got to grind. You got to work all day. You got to go to sleep early be in the gym, you know, all these things, and you're you're sticking to a specific routine. And the problem with that is I think that can become very lonely. And it can kind of affect your mental health if you are focusing too much on a routine and too much on your work and being your best self. But that allows you not to be with other people like your friends. So I think it's important to not have a routine sometimes mm-hmm. and not stick to that type of thing in your daily life. So what would you say about that? What are your thoughts? Well, it depends on the level that you want to play at. I would agree to that if I wanted to only make a few hundred thousand a year. Mm-hmm. At the level that I play this game of entrepreneurship at, I stick to a very tight routine. That doesn't mean that I don't have days off, that I get to just do whatever the heck I want. Go surf, go one wheel, play ping pong with my son, whatever. 
but there's not a sp lot of spontaneity built into my structured days because no different than a, since we're in the month of February, let's use Super Bowl. Now I don't think about sports, but I do know that Super Bowl is right around the corner. Like an NFL level athlete does not, cannot have the same levels of freedom and spontane spontaneity that a high school football player would have. That's just a reality. Like that NFL level athlete, they're paying him millions to do one thing and to do better than anybody else, whether it's catch, block, sprint, whatever. And so I see myself at the level that I play at with the hundreds of millions of dollars that I'm a high level athlete. Everything I do is optimized. So I've got a very specific morning routine, very specific diet, very specific workout, very specific mindset, very specific books I read, very specific people I surround myself with, very specific music that I listen to. Does it get boring sometimes? Yeah, of course. Of course. But I've chosen this life because I've chosen to play at the high level that I'm at. But if I wanted to only make, let's say, a few hundred thousand or a million a year, I could, I could totally do that just flying by the seat of my pants and it would be just as fun. Do you ever go out and drink alcohol and go off of your diet? Never. I'll go off of my diet, but I won't drink alcohol. Okay. I stopped drinking alcohol November 12th, 2022. Not because I'm an alcoholic, but I realized it was a dependency, mm -hmm. not an addiction, a dependency. I'm an introvert by nature. And so when I have a speaking gig and that speaking gig comes with a meet and greet, hey, you can meet and greet with Bedros and take pictures with him like I'm a monkey at a zoo and they get to take pictures with me, which is fine. I totally love it and respect it. But being an introvert, I found that if I have a couple of cocktails, it takes the edge off and mm -hmm. it's like social lubricant for me. And so uh, I'm 49 now, but this was uh, 48 years old when I stopped drinking last year, 2022. Um, I realized after a couple cocktails, yeah, okay, it takes the edge off. But the next morning I woke up a little foggy headed. Like Agreed. alcohol doesn't settle with me the way it used to when I was in my 20s and 30s, number one. Number two, I'm like, now I have a dependency. Whenever there's a social gathering, I want to have a couple of cocktails just to take the edge off. I'm like, dude, you're a grown ass man. You can't just have a little pep talk with yourself and be like, all right, man, icebreaker. What are the three questions you could ask someone? Oh, hey, where, like I asked you, what do you do? Where's home for, from? Like the same questions I asked you, I'm like a fucking robot. Like the same questions I ask you are the same questions I'll ask 700 people who are waiting in a line to do a meet and greet with me. Hey, what's your name? Where are you from? What do you do? Like, do you do it this way or that way? And they feel like, wow, Bedros took interest in me. I just created a process out of getting comfortable in a social environment. That's why I just process everything, systematize everything. Uh, so will I drink? No. Will I go off my diet and have a couple of pretzels and burgers and French fries uh, because fuck it, let's do it? Yeah, I'll plan that out. That. But the next day I'm also crushing legs because yeah. I'm going to maximize all those carbs. You know, you know what I mean? Because yeah. I also want to get veiny and vat, like just like sick legs. And so like, why not take advantage of a killer leg workout the next day? Well, if you're putting it to use, there's no, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. no problem with yeah. that. But no, I totally know how to have a good time. Like, but okay. for me, it, it has to lead to an outcome. Like my, also I'm wired that way. Mm -hmm. There's like a personality deficiency that I have where I'm very judicial. I'm an INTJ, introverted thinker or introverted N for intuitive T thinker J judicial. So like, Everything, so it's like, okay, I could eat 10, 10 slices of pizza, hamburgers, and five baked potatoes with sour cream. How am I going to have earned that the next day? Once I can identify, I'm going to earn that by training legs and then hiking the, the hills here for three miles, it's on. Like, mm -hmm. you're going to be grossed out with the way I eat and have a good time with that food. Um, but if I can't see it as a reward system, then I'm disgusted with myself. And I realize that might be an internal issue that I need mm -hmm. to deal with, but that's how I'm wired. There's nothing wrong with that. Nope. I feel like some of the, like some of my best memories are when I'm being spontaneous and I'm yeah. not fully sticking to a plan or routine. Yeah. So do you think that there is a way to have some sort of balance while still making hundreds of millions of dollars? Sure. I mean, I think I've got balance, but you might hang out with me and be like, bro, you're boring because the whole day's planned out for me, like minute by minute. Everything's planned out. So I might be when like, did you start planning out every minute? Oh, shit. Maybe 11 years ago, 12 okay. years ago. Yeah. Like when, when I, re you know what? 11 years ago, when I had that massive panic attack, and that's because I was more spontaneous. So my numbers, my business was growing, my team was growing, my responsibility was growing, but I was still sleeping in. I was still watching a few extra episodes of my favorite show. I was still kind of um, 
Back then, I would maybe have two or three cocktails, like every other day, at home, not just at an event, right? From, then it went from, hey, just have it at events to take the edge off. And so I was a little more civilian type. And as I got into the more high-performing side of my business, I was like, all right, I had a massive panic attack. And I was like, why do I have this panic attack? Well, my responsibilities are so big, yet I'm living a regular man's life. And I, I can't do that. Like, I either have to downgrade my life or upgrade my habits to live the new lifestyle that I want. And so I chose this new lifestyle because I fucking love it. It's great. Like, my life is awesome. And, and like, it, like, give you an example. A few years back, kid that went to Chino Hills High School here, we saw, like, in the Chino Hills Facebook page that this young girl needed a new heart. And they were trying to raise money, and they just needed $17,000 more. And word had gotten out. And I was like, oh, here's a 17 grand, go. How fucking cool is that? Instead it's of like being, being someone like, oh, you know what? I hope the city comes together and does something about that. <laughs> In the meantime, she's fucking dead, right? I want to be the guy that goes, here's the $17,000. Like, what's wrong with that? And so I'll take that life and have structure and not as much. I have balance, just don't have spontaneity, right? I have balance, meaning I have absolute times of, to decompress because otherwise you're just going to burn out but I just don't have spontaneity. Like, I can't, like if you're like, hey man, after this, you wanna go grab a bite to eat and then uh, the surf's really great in Dana Point, let's grab your boards and go surf. I'm like, oh my God, the surf's really good. Look, it really, but I can't because after this, I gotta do the live for Legacy Tribe. And after that, I got a thing to do tonight. Like my day's planned out until 9 p.m. That's just how it is. Do I'm you like, ever get sick of it? Yeah, but then I'm like, I'm not sick of this like financial freedom and I'm not sick of this freedom, freedom that I have. So literally like I'm doing this because I enjoy this. I wouldn't have invited you here if I wouldn't enjoy this. Uh, working with a client, I enjoy. My mornings are all mine until 12 noon. Wow. 12 noon. That's pretty cool. I didn't get here till 12 noon. So I get a nice workout in, then I stretch, and then I, and then I go to Ayala Park. I shouldn't mention the park because then all the weirdos show up. One time I mentioned where my gym is and there was people at the front of my gym doing push-ups waiting for me to come. Oh like, why my the God. <laughs> it's laughing. Like, why the fuck are you doing push-ups, bro? He's like, I thought I would impress you when you pull up. I'm like, how many have you done? He's like, hundreds. How many people were doing push-ups? There's like three people doing oh push-ups, yeah. And then there's these signs that say BK Strength, like the parking spots, and one of them has like a little kissy, like some chick, like lipstick, and I love you. And so anyway, Wonder don't show up to my gym, don't show up to the fucking park <laughs> I walk to, I walk at, but I'll work out, do mobility, and then go go get my three-mile walk at the park, listen to whatever podcast I want or audio book, uh, come here and shower, um, and then my, my work day actually starts. And, and, I, and I love that. Like, I've got that morning time freedom. And then in the evenings that I get to hire a black belt and have them come to me, to my private gym, awesome. to roll with me instead of going to a jujitsu school with a whole bunch of white belts who are going to spaz out and use bad technique and hurt me or, or it's going to take us longer. In six weeks, I gain, like, I'm tapping out brown belts and black belts. Like, in six weeks. And I'm not saying I'm a jujitsu master. It's just I can afford to buy the best of, of everything. So, like, why not? And then if I want to take... A period of time off i just let ed's wife know ed's wife know joan who's my assistant and she just blocks out a time a window of time moves coaching calls around so i don't have immediate spontaneity but if i wanted tomorrow off i bet she can open up like four hour block for me uh by moving around coaching clients and stuff so that i can go do whatever i wanted to spontaneously do but i don't have this kind of spontane spontaneity like where i can just get up and go do something but i don't want that either because i'm self-destructive i'll mm. go i'll get myself into trouble and there's no coming back from that for me. What kind of trouble? It doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, God. can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's helpful to have, because you, your wife kind of is in a similar position. You know, she's yeah. very hardworking. Do you think very it helps hard. to have those relationships? Yes. We are literally equally yoked. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a biblical person, but I know the Bible talks about, you know, if you got ox and one's like all shriveled up and tiny and the other one's all big and strong and these two ox are pulling the yoke and they're plowing, it's not going to be a straight line. Like you want an equally yoked oxen so that you have a straight line when you're plowing. And, and me and my wife are equally yoked. We're both intense. We're both high speed. We both know how to slow down and have a good time, but it's probably a structured, scheduled, good time, not a spontaneous kind of deal. Um, not to say it doesn't happen spontaneous, because if we have an open weekend, I'm in town, I'm not at a speaking gig. Yeah, everybody like, hey, do you want to go eat somewhere? Do you want to go catch a workout first? Or do you want to go whatever, catch a movie? 
So we definitely fly by the seat of our pants, but it's not an everyday thing. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're fulfilled in what you do, your relationships, Mm -hmm. you don't really need the spontaneity as much. Nope. So how do you attract those types of people in your life? Uh, Go to the places where those people would hang out, Mm -hmm. right? So like if I want to get hit by a bus, best place for me to get hit by a bus is on the street. Go stand in the street, right? And so if I want like a high-speed type A person who's fit uh, as a female counterpart, well, I might go to the gym, early in the morning where discipline times mm-hmm. discipline people show up and then i might get on the hunt and be like what's up girl right like that's is li- that how you would go hit on someone that's how i hit on my wife i was like what's up girl Did you really? no no no, no, no. Like, as she's doing squat she's yeah. like who no, what is this guy no. saying <laughs> no yeah that would be weird uh we were both personal trainers but again we we're both personal trainers worked early in the shit early in the days right yeah. in terms of taking on clients and i saw her work ethic i saw how she- serious she was in her you know this, like some personal trainers will just wing it with the client. Others will like write out a whole program and she, they got the whole thing down for six weeks. She was that girl. Okay. Uh, and I was that guy. And so I'm like, I like how this girl rolls. You know, had her, her ducks were all in line. Like, you know, had her food structured, had her diet structured. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to talk to her. And so I was like, hey, you want to catch a workout? And that's just how it kind of snowballed into marriage. When did you guys first get together? Um, 2001. And then we got married in 2003. Yeah. And so there's a difference, obviously, between attracting the right partner versus attracting good business relationships and friendships. Correct. So what is the difference there? Where would you attract good business relationships and friendships? And when would you cut people off as well? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So finding a right partner, you're probably going to have some things in common, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we're bo- by the way, both my wife and I are foodies. We love food. We, all- we also love working out. So again, I'll eat food, but I better have something planned the next day to tell my reptilian mind that I earned it and didn't just like, you know, eat like a savage without earning it. So we're both foodies. Uh, We we both love like comedy shows. Like we have have a lot of similarities, uh, a lot of of core values. Well, if I'm picking a business partner, I may not want a business partner where we're identical in every way because if I'm a good front man, I might want a business partner who's more behind the scenes running operations mm-hmm. while I'm the face of the brand. If we're both the face of the brand, we're going to have some conflict. And I've been in relationships like that. If we're both trying to run operations, well, there's several ways you can run operations and still become a millionaire, but only your team can only take orders from one head of operations. And so I want to find someone who's complementing to what I do. So if I'm great at driving leads, but I'm not good at sales, I want a business partner who might be good at sales. Or if I can drive leads and do sales, but I'm horrible at delivering the, the product or the results of the service, I want, a, I want a business partner who can who can do that well. Great example of that is my business partner in Fit Body Bootcamp, Bryce. He's the CEO of my company. Uh, I'm the face of the company. Uh, however, he leads and manages the people much better than I do. I only like leading high-performing people, people who are type A, high-speed, tightly wound like me. If you're just a regular person working in the cubicle, I'm going to get frustrated with you. And that frustration would show, and soon my team started to resent me, rightfully so, because, like, I want it this way, and they just kind of, like, lackadaisically roll in, which I get it, man. Like, they're not me. Uh, Whereas Bryce will take time to work with the high-performing people, but then he knows how to manage the rest of the people. He'll talk to them and chit-chat. I'm not a chit-chat kind of guy. And so he is actually a better leader and manager of our brand, Fit Body Bootcamp, than I ever was. Uh, But I recognize that, and so he complements my deficiencies, and so brought him in. Now, where do you part ways with someone? Um, Well, you part ways with someone when they say that they're going to do X, and they don't do X, and they don't meet the expectation. And I've had business partners like that as well, where, you know, hey, we're both going to put in 50000 and start a business. And then turns out we need to add a little bit more because no one ever perfectly estimates how much money is needed to start a business. So now you put in another ten grand, but he can't put in another ten grand. So now you're starting to build resentment. But you would hope that since you put in an extra ten grand, he'll at least work harder. But he's not. Uh, he's doing the bare minimum for. He's doing fifty percent of the work, even though you technically have now sixty percent of the money in. And soon you start building resentment. And soon, if you don't communicate, it's going to end up in a big blowout, uh, which is exactly how a divorce happens, right? And so I'm very methodical now about if I'm going to take on a business partner, why do I want them? What value do they bring that I can't do on my own? Are they bringing money to the equation? If I don't have money and they're bringing money to the equation, cool. 
I'm going to make sure I talk to them and say, hey, you're only bringing in money. You're not a decision maker, so don't make business decisions. I'll make the business decisions. But if they want to make those decisions, then sorry, man, you can't. we can't work together because there can only be one chef in their kitchen, not two. Um, if they say they're going to add value and they don't add the value that they say they can, I'm going to create an operating agreement that says, here's the expectations. Bedros will do this. Annie will do this. And this is how the business will turn out. And then if you don't do your shit, I'm going to call you out. And if we have that conversation two or three times, then I'm going to be like, hey, let's part ways. Uh, either you buy me out or I'll buy you out, but we can't stay friends because this is going to you know, result in chaos. Uh, but not enough people have the uncomfortable conversations that they need to have to part ways in business partnerships. And so great businesses end up struggling, suffering, and going by the wayside because people were too passive aggressive to have the conversations that were required. Well, I think people think that things will always change. They think like, okay, if we keep pushing and we'll try different things, like maybe it'll change. Maybe they'll change and they'll work mm -hmm. harder and they just stick with it. The same thing happens in relationships. Yep. Where they're it. like, we'll stick with it and see what happens. See what happens. And that's yep. when you waste a lot of time. Yeah. And I think time is, when you waste time, it's when you're never going to get anywhere. One, well, you never get anywhere. Two, you don't get that time back. And three, what ends up happening is while we're all hoping, aspirationally hoping that things change, there's a lot of water being built under the bridge. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of resentment being built. Like, like, you know, I know she knows that I like my food to be ready at this time and it's not being made, but I'm not asking for that and you're not doing it and now I'm upset at you. And you're <laughs> like, well, I know that I left the trash bags out and he should have taken that out and he didn't. And I'm not gonna ask him to take it out, but I wish he did. And soon like you hate me for all these little micro stupid stuff. Stupid little things, Stupid yeah. little things that add up into like a big blowout. Yeah. When if we just talked about it, You'd be like, oh, dude, yeah, I have no worries having food ready at that time. And by the way, hey, fella, since you're leaving for something in the morning, can you take the fucking garbage out? Yeah, of course. Sorry, I didn't realize it was such a big deal for you. Yeah, no worries. I got you. It's the community. And by the way, you know, you, you, you nailed it when you said it happens in business. It happens in relationships. It happens in countries that end up warring together. Mm -hmm. You look at Israel and Palestine right now. You look at the Ukraine and Soviet Union or Russia. Um, had they had an open line of communication, had they had some kind of like Let's try and figure this out without killing each other and, lo and, and, and putting the lives of young men and women at risk. I'm sure they could have compromised and come to a solution. But in the absence of communication, we end up going to battle. And that's what happens. And I think, too, in like business and relationships, someone thinks they're above someone. Yeah. Or yeah. they don't want to make someone feel bad. Right. Or something like right. that when it comes to conversations. It seems like you don't have a problem with that. If you if something's on your mind, you'll tell someone. Yeah, only because I've been on the other side. Yeah. I've been the passive aggressive guy. I've been the guy that doesn't, didn't want to communicate. I've been the guy that felt like, oh, the, the other person will figure it out. And when I finally blew up and yelled at the other person, like months later, they were like, dude, I didn't realize you felt that way. I'm like, you didn't? This whole time, I'm like, any minute now, they're going to figure it out. They're just oblivious to well, it. Well, we think people can read our minds or right. something. They exactly. can pick up on our senses and what we're saying when that's really not the case. People think completely different. And a lot of times people are just thinking about themselves. That's and it. What they're doing. That's it. And they don't think about anything else. And you you never really come to a conclusion of yeah. what each other is feeling. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's, that, that's exactly it. And unfortunately, again, if we could communicate our thoughts, feelings, needs, expectations, like there'd be less divorces, less business partnerships falling apart, less countries going to war. Mm -hmm. At the very beginning too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have a pretty small circle, I'm assuming. Very small circle. Okay. And have you had to cut people out recently along the way? Yes. Two, two people who actually have the same tattoo on their hand that I do. Wow. So people pretty close to you. Very close to me. Okay. And why is that? Just different ways of thinking? Uh, they were not who they said they were. I gave them options and choices and opportunities to course correct, and they didn't. And uh, I can't be associated with them because that would make me a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. right? Was because it hard for you to cut people like that off? Not anymore. No. Okay. No. Now no, it's just, it's just a way of life. Are you good at detaching your emotions then from yes. situations? Yeah. And that actually is a byproduct of, I, I've been abused sexually and physically as a kid. And when you've been abused, you know how to disassociate, detach, compartmentalize. And so I turned a traumatic situation that took place in my life into a superpower of being able to detach very quickly from harsh decisions that I have to make. Would you say that's something that mo most people should pick up on? I'm horrible at that, but would you say it's a good mm -hmm. trait to adopt? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. it'll save you some stress. Someone could be dead to me like this. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's crazy. But, I wish I was like that. At the level that I play at, but, but part of it is like at the level that I play at, 
if I don't make that decision, it could cost me hundreds of thousands a month, mm -hmm. a week, a day, possibly millions, right? Because the level that I play at. And so I'm like, oh my God, I can't be hemorrhaging money like that. I can't be, and by the way, the bigger team you have, and I've got a pretty damn big team, they all know who the slacker is. They all know that this person's incongruent. They all know that they are doing shady shit. And so when you as the leader turn a blind eye to it because, oh, well, we're brothers. We have the same tattoo. We do the same thing. Guess what happens next? The rest of your team's like, you know what? The boss is a, is a hypocrite. He's shown favoritism to someone he knows is a scumbag or he's given him a second chance when we wouldn't have that second chance. They lose respect for you. There goes your entire organization. And so at the level that I play at, it has to be a very precision and quick detachment. Do you have a lot of team meetings then regularly? Mm -mm. No. My, my, my team leaders, and, and they do, I don't. Like I'm now at the, in the founder's seat, and it's called the owner's box. Mm -hmm. So I have VPs and CEOs that run all the companies. They have meetings all the time. I just meet with the leaders of my companies once a month. Got it. I, I'm on text with them all day long. Right, like, hey, this happened. Made this decision. Fired this person. Elevated that person. Given this person a, a pay bump or a, or a or a title bump, but that's just via text. What are your most important relationships that you focus on? Uh, my kids, my family, uh, and the people in my tight circle, uh, my, my leaders, uh, some of the people in this room. Um, that's like, and two two specific friends that I have that I've had a relationship with them for twenty five years, like just two. Oh. Like if I called them, they'd show up with a shovel, no questions asked. Well, I feel like it's really hard for you to focus on a lot of people at the same time if you yeah. have so many tasks to do. Yeah. You have to have a small circle. Yeah. yeah. And they have to be reliable. Mm -hmm. And they have to understand like, hey, B, are you in town? No, man, I'm not. Okay, next week when you're in town, let's hang out. Okay, sure, next week. Hey, B, are you in town? No, man, I'm not. Or yes, I am, but I'm busy. Cool. So I may not see my friend Chanta or Bobby for months at a time. But when we do get together, we pick up right where we left off. They have zero resentment. And both of those guys fight me for the check, even though I've got the American Express black card for over <laughs> a decade. And I like that. Those are real friends. Those are real friends. Yeah. Like, I won't even go to the bathroom because I'm afraid the check will come and they'll pay for it. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I have to, like, wait until I pay for the check. And even then, they're fighting me for it. Like, those are real friends. And then there's all the I other people that. who just kind of, the check comes and they're looking the other way. Motherfucker, just like, act, He's got it. <laughs> act like you're going to pay knowing that I'm going to throw the yeah, black card like, down. You know what I mean? Offer, yeah. Yeah, that's all. That was so, therapeutic. Thank you. <laughs> so what's next for you? Uh, to keep doing what I'm doing and mm -hmm. raising two amazing kids. What are you um, most excited for? Maybe I should put it that way. I'm most excited for the next two books that I'm writing. Mm. I can't talk about the title and I can't talk about the genre, but I can't talk about when they're going to come out. But there's two books that I'm writing <laughs> right now and they're going to be even better than my book, Man Up, which was a international bestseller. Hell yeah. We'll be on the lookout for that. And where can they find you on social media? Uh, best place to find me is either on YouTube at Bedros Koulian or on Instagram at Bedros Koulian. Amazing. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you.